first speaker is Dr. Jacob Jake Goheen, assistant professor in the departments of zoology and physiology at UW. Jake has broad academic interests, most of which are centered on the ecology and, nat and the natural history of mammals. He studied mammals for over 10 years in central and eastern Kenya. Jake tries his best to do work that simultaneously, one, informs wildlife conservation, two, is conceptually interesting, and three, builds intellectual infrastructure by training Kenyan and U.S. nationals. Jake's work is diverse, with research projects including the conservation of the world's most endangered antelope, non-lethal control of lions preying on livestock, understanding, I love this one, understanding how trees defend themselves from being eaten by elephants, um, and here in Wyoming, investigating factors responsible for changes in moose numbers. Coming up on the plane with Jake yesterday, I learned that he is a talented bass player, um, so watch for his soon-to-be-formed band, which will be playing gigs in Laramie and around the state, I have no doubt. Today, um, Jake's talk is entitled, Living with Elephants and Lions, Humans and Wildlife on the Kenyan Landscape. Please welcome Jake Goheen. Great. Thanks, Peter. Uh, thanks all for coming. I was uh, relieved when we touched down uh, yesterday and I saw this elk mount because I thought it meant that it was okay for me to wear jeans today. <laughs> um, so that was a relief. Unpretentious, nice, small, intimate place. Um, <coughs> so today I'd like to talk to you about three stories. And these three stories come from uh, work that my research group has been doing in central and eastern Kenya. And these three stories are informed by kind of the academics or the theory surrounding ecology, community ecology in particular. Um, but what keeps me interested is their applicability to real world scenarios out there. Real world um, environmental issues and issues in uh, wildlife management <coughs> and so forth. Um, I'd like to start by uh, acknowledging our research partners, the National Museums of Kenya, Kenya Wildlife Service, and others, um, our funding agencies, and uh, these two fellows. Uh, these are uh, my field assistants, Ali and Simon. Um, when I say we today, I use uh, we in the loosest sense possible to mean they. Um, <laughs> and when I say I, I mean that in the loosest sense possible to mean we. Um, so <laughs> please keep that in mind uh, throughout this talk. <coughs> so um, a few kind of uh, boilerplate facts about Kenya that you might not know about. Uh, the first is that it's about 600,000 square kilometers, i.e. about twice the size of Wyoming, but it has about 70 times the number of people as does Wyoming. The per capita GDP is about $800 per year. Um, if you took uh, politicians out of this equation, it would probably be about $300 per year. Uh, in contrast, that of uh, the average U.S. citizen, or the average GDP, per capita GDP for the U.S. is about $47,000. 18% of its land is devoted to national parks and reserves. To me, this is an astounding figure for a developing country like this. Uh, in comparison, 3% of our land is. There's about 40 tribes in Kenya. They speak about 70 different languages. The three stories that I want to that I want to tell today are what we've cutely called David and Goliath. This is about elephant compression and landscape change. Incidentally, uh, I'd like to make this as informal as possible, so if ever you have questions or something's unclear, just blurt it out, please. The second story I want to tell is about cattle grazing as a tool to offset losses to lions. And the third is about conservation of the rarest antelope on planet Earth. So the first of these, David and Goliath, Elephant Compression and Landscape Change. This is work that has largely been done uh, by my field assistants and myself, uh, my graduate students. This occurs at this particular property in central Kenya, 
called Lewa Downs Conservancy, and also in the southeastern tip of the country in Sabo National Park. <coughs> in my mind, this is an example of blind luck in wildlife conservation. And the reason I say that is that initially this story was motivated by a very long-standing, very simple question that we have in ecology. And that question is, why is the world green? When you look at planet Earth through outer space, its terrestrial surface looks green. And about 50 years ago, a group of ecologists came up with the hypothesis that the world is green because predators, like this cheetah, by suppressing herbivores, like this gazelle, indirectly facilitate plants. The world is green because predators keep herbivores in check and help out the plants. There's a very straightforward al alternative to this, this hypothesis. And that alternative is that plants are not these hapless victims. They defend themselves with chemicals, with spines, with thorns. So the alternative to the original green world hypothesis where predators are helping out plants is that plants themselves are really well defended. And there are further two, I guess we'll call sub-hypotheses under that plant defense hypothesis. The first is that plants that are really rare ought not to invest a lot in defense. Those plants that are common, that are really apparent, ought to invest strongly in defense. So this guy is using its neighbors for protection. The second sub-hypothesis is that we ought to see a lot of investment in plant defenses by plants where resources are high. Resources like rainfall or nutrients. Um, I'm sorry, where resources are low. We ought not to see a lot of plant defense where resources are high. The reason for this is because where resources are low, if you're eaten by an herbivore, you have a more difficult time bouncing back. So it behooves you not to be eaten in the first place and to really protect yourself. When one goes to East or Southern Africa, one often sees these conspicuous effects of elephants. I always ask my undergrads, what has happened here before we start talking about elephants? And about 90% of them say, this tree was hit by lightning. In fact, this tree was clobbered by a bull elephant. It was, it was browsed, it was knocked over, and it subsequently died. So because this effect is so conspicuous, we have this temptation to conclude that when elephant numbers go up, trees ought to go down. And when elephant numbers go down, trees ought to go up. In the system where we work, there are four relatively abundant large herbivores. Bush elephants and giraffes are what we call quote unquote mega herbivores. They're so big that they can escape predators just by virtue of their size. These guys both weigh in excess of a metric ton. In contrast, our various species of antelopes, our zebras, our warthogs, they're limited by predators. So if we think back to that green world hypothesis, predators cannot control these guys. They're too big. Plant defense is our only hope for plants. So, this is a satellite image of a ranch uh, on which I've done a bit of work. These red outlines are elephant exclusion fences, believe it or not. This ranch is well known and has had a lot of success in breeding black rhinos, which are a critically endangered species. And there is a perception out there that elephants and black rhinos compete. So what this ranch has done is build these huge electrified fences in an attempt to keep out elephants and bolster numbers of black rhinos. This ranch is divided into two parts, one on red soil, these are sandy soils, one on black soil, these are clay soils. 
derived from volcanic ash. <coughs> so, you might be wondering what I mean by elephant compression. I'm not talking about the squashing of elephants. <laughs> what I'm talking about is roughly 40 years ago, we had 1.2, 1.3 million African elephants, bush elephants throughout the continent. Between now and then, the number of elephants has decreased to about half a million. But the geographic range they occupy, the amount of space they occupy, has decreased even more to about 30%. So elephants are half as abundant as they once were, but they're occurring in, as, in one third as much space. That means where elephants still occur, they're really abundant. They're more abundant than they have been historically. They've been compressed into these areas where they still occur. If we look at this property, Lewa Downs, we have seen that the number of elephants has tripled in the past four to five years. That's an astounding figure. This isn't because elephants are breeding more. It's because of political instability in northern Kenya that is compressing them into this property. Numbers of giraffes have declined a bit. They've mostly stayed the same. Numbers of black rhino, again, this is a black rhino breeding sanctuary, have mostly stayed the same. This is what one of these elephant fences looked like. It's ran at about two and a half meters with strands of wire at about 8,000 volts. Shocking elephants to keep out of these areas. Okay. How, how are those fences powered? How are they powered? Big batteries. <laughs> Big batteries and solar panels. So, one of the nice things that we had was a bunch of satellite images of tree cover in this period in which elephants really skyrocketed. We had a satellite image from 2003, a satellite image from 2008. So what we did was ask the question, how does this increase in numbers of elephants influence tree cover? Trees in these images are everything that's black. Each little black point represents an individual tree. And what you can see between 2003 and 2008 is that the amount of tree cover really declines in these fences, or outside these fences in red soil, and it really increases inside the fences. But if we look on that nutrient-rich black soil, we see changes in tree cover, but they're not as marked, they're not as pronounced as what we see in the red soil. So you can combine this into a single graph. What we've got is change in the percent of tree cover on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, we've got two different types of soil, that nutrient-poor red soil, that nutrient-rich black soil. These black bars represent elephant exclusions. These white bars represent outside those exclusion fences. By putting up a fence, you really change the tree cover for elephants, but only on these red soils. You don't see much of a change in the black soils. Hmm. What I haven't told you is that 99% of the trees on the black soil look like this. But this tree is altogether absent from the red soil. So if you're an herbivore looking for a tasty meal, would you eat that? Perhaps not. So in addition to these really long spines, the astute viewer will notice these black galls, these ping pong ball sized galls, <coughs> from which spew tens of thousands of ants when this elephant tries to eat this tree. And if you think about elephants, they're unique. They're unique in many ways, but one of the ways is that what they eat with, their mouth, is a long ways from what they use to grab food with, their trunk. And so if I'm an elephant and I take a mouthful of this tree, I'm going to get 
thousands of ants swarming up into my nostrils. So, we ask the question, could it possibly be that these three milligram ants are effective bodyguards against 30 billion milligram elephants? And once in a blue moon, you will see a tree that isn't defended by ants that occurs on that black, nutrient-rich soil. And that tree almost invariably looks like this, completely shredded by elephants. So believe it or not, we went to an elephant orphanage. This is an area in Sabo National Park where they get eight, nine, and ten-year-old elephants whose moms have been poached and they try and rehabilitate these elephants to go run with wild herds. There is a giant corral to which these orphan elephants have the option of returning every night. They know they'll find food and water there. When we were working there, though, these orphan elephants came back and they found only these four <laughs> piles of branches, much to their disappointment. What these four piles of branches are are different cuttings from trees with and without ants. So we have that tree that's naturally defended by ants. We gave them a pile of that. Then we took that same tree, but we used machetes to hack those galls off, to remove those ants. We gave them a pile of that. Then we had the tree that normally doesn't have ants on it. Gave them a pile of that. And finally, our fourth basic food group, the tree that naturally doesn't have ants, we added ants to it. The prediction is simple, right? It said if ants are deterring elephants, it shouldn't matter what species of tree the ants are on, it should only matter that it has ants. So this is punchline number two. Ants reduce the tastiness of these trees for elephants, believe it or not. So on this y-axis, we get the probability that a branch will be eaten by an elephant, the probability of use against time. We did this for about an hour. Points that are red represent the tree that is naturally tasty. It's the tree that doesn't have ants on it in nature. Points that are black represent the tree that naturally is well defended by ants. Circles represent trees to which either naturally have ants or to which we added ants, and triangles Oh, I'm sorry, circles represent those that don't have ants on them at all. And triangles represent those to which we either added ants or naturally had ants. And sure enough, you can see from this graph that elephants do not distinguish between the species of tree. They only distinguish, does it have ants on it? This was, uh, quite frankly, pretty mind-blowing to me. I was stunned that that experiment worked. Um, <coughs> and. I was further stunned that this actually had an application. A lot of times people say, well, good is basic research. And oftentimes academics kind of shuffle their feet and, you know, try and change the subject. <laughs> um, <coughs> but um, unpredictably to us at the outset of this work was the fact that it could actually help black rhinos. And the reason for that is because we were able to go to the managers of this property and say, hey, these ants do as good a job defending your trees from elephants as do these big, expensive electric fences. Now, we could never have predicted that outcome at the outset of the work, right? But just by happenstance, by serendipity, we were able to kind of shift the flow of money, at least in parts, from erecting these huge fences to investing more in things like anti-poaching squads. That's story number one. Story number two, cattle grazing is a tool to offset effects of lion restoration. This is work by my student, Caroline Ingueno, she is a PhD student at the University of Wyoming and in the program in ecology there. So, as I've already uh, discussed, about 20% of Kenya's land is protected in the form of national parks and reserves. The Kenyan government 
will reclaim land that is not used. By used, they mean devoted to agriculture in some form or livestock production. So, the long-term conservation of wildlife requires creative solutions for compatibility between humans and their livestock and wildlife. <coughs> Caroline works at Old Pejeda Conservancy, which is about two hours south of that elephant work I just spoke about. She works in Lycipia District. Lycipia District is about 10,000 square kilometers. There's a lot of different private property parcels. Those parcels are devoted to varying extents to livestock production. By livestock, I mean cattle in this area, and also wildlife tourism. Conservation in this area is entirely voluntary. Lycipia District occurs outside of national parks and reserves. Astoundingly, it has the highest abundances of wildlife anywhere in Kenya, despite lacking formal protection. That's amazing to me. A world without large mammalian predators has become the new normal, such that most people don't even know the effects of them not existing. Folks in this audience might notice just because of where you live. But I might ask you to imagine a world without large predators. Some of you might rejoice. Others of you would be disappointed. But I'm then going to ask you, what are the ecological consequences of not having large predators around? Do we have lots of white-tailed deer in our fields? Right? <laughs> Are the effects more gradual? Are they more subtle? Do we get differences in disease outbreaks, maybe, or nutrient cycling, maybe even this contentious term, climate change? Now I want you to imagine that same world with predators restored. Does that world function the same as the one prior to when predators were extirpated? And how do you know? This is a real challenge for ecologists. We lose predators, we put them back in, and they have effects that are wholly unanticipated. And the reason for that is because, point, because between point A, when we lost predators, and point B, when we restored them, a lot of other things have changed in the environment. It makes their effects makes the effects of restoration hard to predict. So, I want you to focus on yet another graph. Here we have ungulate abundance per square kilometer. Ungulate's a fancy term for a mammal that has a hoof. The first observation is that in Lycipia District, plain zebra, these good looking horses here, and cattle have not declined over two decades. Their numbers are controlled by rainfall. In contrast, these four ungulates, these four hoofed mammals, have all declined since the mid-1980s. And in the mid-1980s, ranchers in this area became more tolerant of lions. They became more tolerant of lions because there was a slow realization that by having lions on their properties, they could bolster their, lives, their earnings from livestock production with money from ecotourism. So they stopped shooting lions, lions came back, and these four species declined. One might ask, is this a problem? I can't speak to that. But one thing I can say is that ranchers in this area are reconsidering, re-implementing lethal control of lions. They see things like hartebeest, this ungainly looking fellow here, decline and they think, oh boy, we, need, we really need to get a handle on these lions. Okay? But at the same time, there's this tension because they know that by having lions, their tourism dollars are bolstered. So, so where, where are the lions dropping in on this first lion? Right here. I didn't tell them to ask that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Observation three, zebra prefer to graze in areas where cattle recently have been corralled. So livestock production out there is a bit different from here in that your cattle are put into a corral every single night. That corral is predator proof. It's a big chain link fence that comes up at the top that prevents lions and spotted hyenas from jumping in there. It's also protected by local herders and dogs. So livestock losses to lions out there are not as big a deal as say livestock losses here to wolves or grizzlies or mountain lions. So we create these corrals, cattle go in them for about a month, and then there's this nice ring of what the cattle have left behind. And over the course of about a year, that ring results in what we call a grazing lawn. This nice flush of green grass that function as zebra magnets. Zebra just love this stuff. So Caroline is asking the question, by changing where zebra occur with this kind of clever, proactive cattle management, can we shift the hunting behavior of lions? So lions in this system require zebra to thrive, but they prefer to eat hard beast. So when I explain this to my students, imagine that you're at a bunch of high school kids in a high school cafeteria. They're there because it's lunchtime. And they show up and there's something just heinous to eat. Just big vats of green beans or something. <laughs> but there's a single slice of pepperoni pizza. That pepperoni pizza just goes fast. But they'll still eat those green beans because they don't want to starve. The green beans are the zebra. The pepperoni pizza is the heart of beast. Okay? The zebra subsidize the lions, but the lions prefer the heart of beast. Good question. Zebra are really tough to bring down relative to a heart of beast. They kick, they bite, Broken they jaws. fight. Broken jaws, for the lions. Broken jaws for the lions. In contrast, these are sitting ducks. One quirk of their biology leads us to think that we might be able to move these grazing lawns around and alleviate predation on these and it's that these are territorial. They stay in one place. They are not attracted to the grazing lawns like zebra. So we can use clever cattle management to push and pull zebra around on that landscape. And these stay in the same places. And so what we're trying to do is see by making these magnets for zebra, can we also push and pull those lions around? That way everybody has their cake and eats it too. We don't have to go out and shoot lions, right? We bolster numbers of heart beast, and we do it through proactive livestock management. Yes, sir. Uh, now, my knowledge isn't entirely up to date, so it may have changed, but as far as I know, historically, at least uh, you know, in the last 50 years, the Kenyan government has not allowed the human predator to play a part in sustainable utilization. So you mentioned now they're considering going back to shooting lions, mm -hmm. but if you were to introduce sustainable utilization, which has been so incredibly successful, other places around right. Africa, wouldn't that be the best of all worlds? I'll answer that question when I'm not being videotaped. <laughs> I'm serious. You're, you're right on, and a lot of people, myself included, agree with you. There are political reasons why that can't happen. And I'd, I'd love to talk to you after this and let you know why. That was story number two. Story, the third and final story. The third and final story is spearheaded by this fellow, Abdullahi Hussein Ali, also a PhD student at our university and in the program of ecology. Ali is working to conserve the rarest antelope on Earth. And in so doing, we are trying to build intellectual infrastructure in a political tension zone, right here on the Kenya-Somali border. 
Ali is Somali. That means he can work here where few others could. <clears throat> this is the rarest antelope on earth. This is the Hirola, Beatragus hunteri. Gorgeous animal. Long, lyrate horns. Okay? They're sometimes called four eyed antelope because they have these big glands right in front of their eyes. They're sometimes called spectacled antelope because they have this white crescent. This is a male that's in good shape. This guy's a stud. He's got these rings by his neck and his ears move forward. Those rings become more pronounced. He's got a hump right here. Okay? Now, there are about 500 of these left. Depending on how often you think about wildlife populations, 500 might, might sound like a lot. I don't know. It probably isn't, though. Um, not only are there very few Hirola, and not only are they confined to this 12,000 kilometer swath of land on the Kenya-Somali border, but they're very distinct evolutionarily. There's nothing else like them. Okay? They have very few close relatives. Some of their closest relatives are those hartebeest we just talked about. And because of that, Hirola have become a focal species for the Zoological Society of London's EDGE program, where EDGE is an acronym for evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered. Some perspective, if you thought 500 was a lot. Black-footed ferrets, arguably North America's rarest species. I say arguably because it could also be Vancouver marmots. There's about 700 of these in the wild more than 1,000 in captivity. Bison, 15,000 in the wild, 10 times that in captivity or on ranches. Hirola, 450 or 430 in the wild, about none in captivity. More perspective. These are four genera of mammals that we have lost in recent memory. This rat kangaroo that occurred in northern Australia, hunted by introduced foxes and cats. This pica that occurred in southern Italy, extinct in the late 1700s, hunted by humans. This stellar sea cow occurred in the North Pacific, hunted by humans. This Tasmanian wolf, or thy thylacine, competition and disease from dogs. We lost the thylacine roughly in 1936. This could be our next genus of mammal that we lose. Is that, is that a no, not at all, sir. These have always been rare. These have always been rare. You'll note the question mark. If we lose these, ironically, we'll have no idea why. Because of where these occur, and it's such a um, difficult area in which to work, we lack fundamental understanding of this species biology. It's a large mammal. This is slightly smaller than an elk. We don't know why it's declining in this day and age. We do have a, yes, sir? Have there been any efforts to try to preserve these in captivity? Or any yes. They do not do well in captivity. They just die. We don't know why. We do have a few hints, though. The first of these is that numbers of Hirola have declined with numbers of elephants. Hirola are these filled black circles. Elephants are the white circles. Mind you, this is in a different area of Kenya than I was talking about at first. This is on the Kenya-Somali border, very eastern border of Kenya. If we look at change in tree cover through time in this area, we see that tree cover has gone up. With that increasing tree cover, the Hirola's range has collapsed. It's gotten much smaller. What we think might be occurring here, elephants were poached out of this area in the 1970s, right when political turmoil was at its peak in this area. Following elephant declines, trees have increased. These trees are not defended by ants. They increased. They converted open grassland to woodland. Hirola are an open grassland specialist. We suspect, but don't know, that the decline of elephants in this area 
has triggered this decline in the range of Hirola, the collapse in the range of Hirola. There is hope. Normally, as an ecologist, when I see a story like this, I think, this is tragic, but this thing is on its way out. Let's not spend a lot of time and money on it. This is an exception for me. It's exceptional because this species has a near mythological status with Somali herders in this area. And that is because where range quality is good, you will see Hirola, and you can put your cattle there. And as far as we know, they don't compete. There was a property set up called the Ishak Bean Community Conservancy, about 47,000 hectares, 8,000 of which were, for, were um, kind of a sanctuary, a low grazing area for livestock. In Ishak Bean, we have a third of the world's population of Hirola. Recolonization of predators, specifically cheetah and wild dogs, may be suppressing recruitment of Hirola calves in this area. So again, we have this predator restoration that has this unanticipated consequence. So, there was a sanctuary recently established as a source for future reintroductions for Hirola. 48 Hirola, about a tenth of the world's population, was moved into that sanctuary and they're housed there. As scientists, we can ask the question, okay, given that we've just put a bunch of Hirola in this predator-proof sanctuary, are predators really depressing their numbers? Or is this just something that people assert? So, we collect data on their demography, namely their survival and the recruitment of calves. We collect it to understand the relative importance of predation and grass quality in driving those Hirola numbers. So, we have three situations inside that sanctuary where there are Hirola and some other wildlife, but no predators. Outside the sanctuary, but inside that Ishik Bean property, where there are Hirola and predators like cheetah and wild dogs, and then outside Ishek Bean, where we have Hirola, predators, and livestock. This approach allows us to kind of separate, to disentangle the effects of predators versus the effects of range quality on numbers of these guys. After we collect this data, we can incorporate it into national conservation plans. There has been very, very little data in the conservation plans for Hirola because of how difficult they are to work on. We can then provide insight into our biggest bang for the buck to guide future management interventions. We could focus on stopping poaching. These guys are collecting snares that often are targeted towards things like giraffe and warthog, but incidentally, they'll catch Hirola. We can think about prescribed burns as a way to bolster Hirola numbers. The next bit of data we collect is data on habitat selection and movement. We do this to understand how plants and other habitat variables translate into the survival of Hirola and the recruitment of their calves. And we do this to provide scientific backing to future reintroductions from that sanctuary. So these are three individual Hirola that are collared with GPS collars that take a fix once every hour. This dark stuff is woodland. You can see two things from this. One, those Hirola are territorial. They don't overlap. Two, they don't like woody areas. So, the next step could be, as crazy as it sounds, to restore elephants to a part of the Hirola's geographic range. In particular, we are thinking about Arawale National Reserve. Elephants have difficulty recolonizing this area once they've been poached out because the Tana River, which you can barely see here, presents a barrier to their movement. This is a big operation if it happens. 
as you might imagine. It will only happen through the support of locals and close collaboration with locals. As I discussed, the Harola occurs entirely outside national parks and reserves. So, through engagement by Ali with his Somali friends and neighbors, the Harola might stand a fighting chance. And there's cause for cautious optimism here. Uh, that's the end of my third story. And thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I can, if we have time, I can try and answer. Is there a poaching problem with the Harola? That's a good question. We don't think so for a few reasons. Or if there is, we think it's probably of less importance than the range quality and potentially the recolonized predators. The reason for that is that Somalis don't like to eat bush meat. They would rather eat a cow or a goat or a sheep that they raise. Once in a while, when desperate times come, they will set snares. But with those snares, they are not targeting Hirola. They're targeting things like warthogs and lesser kudus, the striped antelope, even giraffes. Um, but when that happens, Hirola can sometimes be at the wrong place, wrong time, and they incidentally get snared. My guess, wild speculation, is that poaching is not as big an issue as the other two factors I discussed. How does this young man, for example, who's Somalian, is such an asset, are you actively recruiting students from Africa? Yeah. So uh, in our research group, um, we have seven graduate students. Um, three of them are Kenyans. Uh, three are from the U.S., and then we have an oddball Canadian. Um, so I actively recruit Kenyan students for the reason that, in my mind, uh, for conservation and wildlife management to work over there, it can't just be me coming and going once a year, and then when the project's done, I check out. The goal of this, the goal of our research group is to provide intellectual infrastructure and training um, to generate over the long term scientific independence in this part of the world um, because ultimately uh, the success or failure of conservation efforts will require that buy-in from locals. How big of a role does funding play? <laughs> Work with what? Huge, huge. I spend a lot of time uh, on that. And um, it's tricky, to, to be honest, because, I mean, you've got a species, we'll just throw them back up here. You've got a species that is uh, beautiful. It's a large mammal. But has anyone in this room heard of this thing before today? Mm -mm. We think of endangered species and we think of, you know, pandas or something that's pretty high profile. So it can be hard. I mean, in my mind, this thing's charismatic, but it's not high profile. So it can be difficult to articulate the plight of this species relative to things that are more familiar. Yes, sir? Within the communities that the, the ranchers do graze their cattle, you said they had a mythic status. Is it mm. well known there then? Is there more Very much so. But for lack of a better term, these people are dirt poor. They do not have the luxury. Um, they do what they can. Um, but financially, doing something like um, <laughs> uh, an operation like this, or an operation like this, they, no, they can't do it. Mm -hmm. In your research, when you're talking about conservation of endangered species, do you find that the people with whom you speak just all accept conservation of an, of an endangered species is a good, just an inherent good? Or do you have to talk about, and how would you talk about the right. value of preserving endangered good. species? Good. Really good question. I could go on on that, but I'll try and make it a bit short and sweet. Um, uh, Yes, 
I de- I, 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 yes, ideally, ideally, like, I bet I could ask folks in this room, are you, you know, do you, do you think we should prevent endangered species from going extinct? Most people would be like, yeah. And then I could ask them, do we think, do you think that we should prevent them from going extinct if there's an economic cost with it? So the question, the more interesting question is, to what degree will you allow yourself to be inconvenienced by something to see it persist? And the farther away from it you are, the less inconvenience you will suffer. Witness wolves and grizzlies in this state. 90 to 95% of the U.S. wants them around. But the 5% who doesn't lives really close to them. That's not an accident. Yes, ma'am. They usually, if they're lucky, they pull off one a year. Gestation, ah, wild guess. I would guess about six months, so six to eight way. months. That's part of the problem, but that's not unusual for a large right, mammal that size, right? Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Scenarios. You I didn't understand if they started to be set up or were going to be where you have the, the cattle, the three mixes versus the two versus the one. Uh, oh, okay. Has that started? This. Yeah. It has. That predator-proof sanctuary was built last year, and the Herola were moved into it about 10 months ago in August, in August 2012. You're probably not getting any clues at this point in time as to what, what might be happening. That's correct. It's too... It's too short, which is another thing that drives managers and the public crazy, I think, about science. Scientists, for better or worse, are very careful. Things take a long time. With their reduced numbers, and particularly the 48 that were isolated, could uh -huh. inbreeding be adding to their demise? Mm. Good question. We don't know the answer to that. With the ones that are inside the sanctuary, the goal is three years from now to reintroduce those animals, to reintroduce sanctuary bred animals. So you don't, we shouldn't have an inordinate amount of inbreeding inside the sanctuary. With respect to your broader question, when you have a population of small, isolated individuals, you bet inbreeding could be an issue. And we don't, and we don't know about that. Sounds like you speculated on maybe two potential reasons for the varroas to be declining, and there's some urgency, it sounds like, to get it fixed. And one is the predators, and then the other has to do with the elements and the environment, the trees. Correct. Can you separate the, uh, the timber out in this, in, with this slide here? Is the amount of timber and grassland the same in all of these? Um, right. Um, when Trees encroach in this area. <clears throat> it usually is accompanied by a decline in the grass. But there are other reasons why grass quality can decline, one of which is you have too many goats and sheep in the area for too long a period of time. Um, in terms of separating the effect of tree cover by itself, independently of other changes in grass quality, we cannot do that. The best we can hope for is to take our telemetered animals and just ask the question, where do they go? Do the ones that on rare occasions stray into woods, do they incur a cost? Do they die quicker? Do they have less kids? So with respect to the actual um, influence of timber, we're left with this kind of observational approach rather than the experiment. It doesn't sound like the elephant, reintroducing elephants is a done deal. Absolutely not. So is there a way to, I mean, harvesting timber can be economically profitable. Right. So can you possibly do that with these environments and to introduce a fourth environment, another right. variable so you can figure it out sooner? Right. Um, no, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, 
one, we could. That's a good idea. We could do it. Um, one of the tricks, it's a great idea, and I'll think about it. One of the tricks is that this area is very sparsely populated, and these woods are huge. The amount of woods you would have to clear to see an effect is probably pretty big. Um, you know, to, to clear a few hectares or something and have that show up on the radar of a Hirola might be a stretch, but if you could clear a few thousand, you might get an effect. One of the things that you can do to do that that's a little more um, time efficient is burning to some extent. Good question. Yes, sir. If you would allow me a comment rather than a question. By all means. In my opinion, mm -hmm. every trophy hunter on the face of the earth wants one of these in their collection. And that the future yeah. of these animals were put in their hands mm -hmm. with a promise that they would have the possibility of an opportunity to collect one provided that there was a stable population mm -hmm. to allow a sustainable harvest, the future of that animal would be guaranteed. Couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Let's end on a note of agreement. <laughs> Thanks, thank you very much, Jake. We'll take a 10, we'll take a 15 minute break and then we will come back for Craig's talk. So thanks everybody. Thanks.